Hey guys, what's up? Uh, so in this video I'm gonna answer all of your questions about uh, Blackmagic's new camera, the Pocket 6K. Now right next to it I've got the Pocket 4K and the reason is because uh, a lot of the questions you guys sent in to me were in relation to the tool. So anyways, let's get started. So the first question, and uh, this is probably the most popular question, uh, has to do with the autofocus. Uh, so how is the autofocus? Uh, well, I would pretty much say there is no autofocus in this camera and it, this is the same for both of these, for the 4K and the 6K. So if you already know the, own the 4K, then you know exactly how it is in the 6K because it's identical. Uh, the only difference is that now you can do it with obviously Canon EF lenses. But basically the way that it works is you can either press this little button here on the back, which will focus right in the center, or you can, for example, press and hold it here and it will then focus for you. But yeah, you know, it takes a while, it kind of goes in and out, and it's, uh, it's basically not the, the fastest uh, way to focus. Now, is it actually accurate? Yes, the autofocus is accurate, but it's something that you probably want to do before you start recording. So just make sure you, your shot is in focus, then record, because if you're actually going to do this while you're rolling, then your shot is going to look horrible, because each time you press the uh, autofocus function, then the camera kind of goes hunting back and forth and then it finds the, the right focus spot. And there is no such thing as track focusing or anything like that. And uh, now I know some people are going to be complaining about that. For me, it's not a problem for a lot of people who are going to buy this camera for what it's actually meant to be, which is like film work or let's say music videos. Uh, they also won't care because after all, the name of the camera is the Blackmagic Cinema or the Pocket Cinema Camera. And, uh, you know, cinema stands for the fact that you're always going to be manually focusing. Uh, now, the cool thing is that you can actually use the app, that, uh, the, the Bluetooth app, that allows you to connect to this camera, just like you can to the 4K camera. And through that app, you can actually control the focus of your lens. So you can remotely just basically pull the focus and, and adjust it uh, that way. Again, it's not out of focus, but it, uh, the cool thing is, I think, that now, on a, for example, you can have this camera just like you could with the 4K. Uh, you can put the Pocket 6K on a gimbal, let's say, and then you can have one person operate the gimbal while the other person operates the, the focus remotely. Now, the uh, next question is, uh, is there any IR pollution problems when using ND filters? Uh, I, I'm sure it's gonna be different with different filters. Uh, the ones that I'm using, which is the Power XND, those are my favorite variable ND filters that I throw onto these kind of smaller cameras. Uh, and that's what I've been using when I was getting all that uh, test footage that I showed in my review of the Pocket 6K. Uh, I used that in pretty much all of those shots, and uh, actually in all of those shots, because I was outside and there was a lot of sun. And I never once noticed any problems with, uh, with you know, IR pollution. Now, uh, if you guys want, I can kind of show you here these quick little comparisons. And you, can, you guys can kind of see for yourself how it uh, looks there without the ND and then with the NDs on. Uh, at various strengths. Now, if you guys want to watch uh, those tests kind of more detail and higher resolution, then uh, as always, head on over to my website, tomantosfilms.com. Over there, you can s download all of the sample footage from uh, both of these cameras and you can kind of compare it for yourself. All right, so next question is, uh, can we mount EFS lenses? Yes, you can. Uh, I've tested out uh, the Canon EFS uh, 18 to 135 millimeter lens. Uh, on the on the Pocket 6K without any problems. It works identical like the Canon EF lenses. The, the touch to focus function works, the image stabilization, everything is the same, and you can obviously control your aperture. All right, the next question is uh, about uh, the crop factor. So in 1080p or 2.8K, is it cropped? Uh, and if so, by how much? Uh, it is cropped, so there's different resolutions. If you're shooting in 6K, obviously uses the whole sensor. Uh, and 5.7K is going to be cropped. Uh, also, you have uh, 4K, uh, but 4K right now is in ProRes only. Uh, and then otherwise, you also have uh, 3.7K anamorphic, which is windowed, and then 2.8K, uh, which is also windowed. And in 1080p, you can actually use the full sensor. So 1080p doesn't have to be cropped. Now, when you're actually in 1080p, but the full sensor, meaning the 6K sensor being downscaled to 1080p, you can do slow motion, but it's basically the same as if you're recording in 6K. So the max frame rate is 50 frames per second. Now, if you change the, uh, the crop factor to 2.8, 
uh, basically so then it's, it's cropping it the same as it would on a 2.8 uh, basically 2.8k resolution uh, then you can uh, suddenly jump to 120 frames per second uh, in 1080p uh, and then uh, that maybe will take me to the next question which is about uh, uh, the different frame rate options so you basically can record you know 24 frames per second you can actually go down to uh, you can do uh, time lapse uh, all the way to, to like one frame per second or, or even slower uh, but the maximum frame rate is going to be 120 frames per second and to reach that frame rate you have to be in 2.8k uh, resolution so or, which is window at, at that point uh, that's how you're going to get that that uh, speed now there is another um, uh, here another resolution which is the 5.7k which i know some people are wondering why why would you want that when it's so similar to the 6k well that's because in 5.7k you can then jump to uh, a higher frame rate uh, which is 60 frames per second uh, so 60 frames per second in 5.7k or you can also do that in 6k but in the wide aspect ratio meaning it doesn't record or scan the top or bottom of the sensor so it's a wider aspect ratio of 2.4 to 1 and that one you can also record up to 60 frames per second otherwise the full sensor full 6k sensor readout in maximum frame rate is going to be 50 frames per second uh, the next question here uh, we got is uh, 6k is is the 6k mode only uh, available in full sensor yes it's only available in full sensor because uh, you, you cannot basically crap in it's gonna because basically there's no more photo sites on there so uh, obviously you can do always zoom in afterwards in your own editing software or you can just simply punch in uh, by using one of the lower resolutions but uh but otherwise if you're recording in 6k it's always going to use the full full size or the full uh, super 35 millimeter uh, image sensor is there more uh, um there i mean there's every camera is going to have more uh, it's just a, i guess a question of uh it, just how bad is the is the more going to be uh on these cameras actually both of them they're it's pretty good uh the whatever it is that they're using in front of the sensor uh the the filter the, the you know optical low pass filter it, it's doing its job now it is going to be noticeable in some extreme cases but like for example if you look at my tests uh from the the cinema camera shootout where i compared this camera to the Arri alexa or so many pro and the, the red raven in those tests, I, at the end of the, that video, I have more uh, tests and you can see it's very similar to, to pretty much identical to Ursa Mini Pro and I would even say very similar to the, the Airy. Now, some people actually prefer this versus the Airy. Some people prefer the Airy versus this, but I think the difference is very negligible. All right, next question. Um, are you able to simultaneously record audio from both the mini XLR as well as the mini jack input? And yes, you can. So if you think about that, you can actually record, I guess, technically three channels because you can record, obviously, the mini XLR is going to be one channel only or mono. But on the 3.5 millimeter jack on the top here, uh, you can record the stereo. So you can have two channels there. So you could actually be recording three separate microphones at once and, and the cool thing is too that you know in the audio settings you can choose for example like uh, you know on channel one which uh, w which signal you want to get whether it's from the xlr 3.5 or maybe even the built-in microphone in the camera and then on the uh, second channel you can also you know mix and match any of those or you can just duplicate it and have xlr let's say coming into both channels or or vice versa now obviously if you're going to be recording or try to record those three channels the only problem then is going to be that your two channels that are coming in through the uh, the three and a half millimeter jack are going to be, have to be recorded on either channel one or channel two so meaning the left and right that's going to be coming in on, on the, the mini jack uh, port is is going to be then uh, you know the audio i would say the level is and, and the audio is going to be mixed down together to one mono signal or one channel so they just keep that in mind but yeah technically you could even record like i said three separate microphones another question uh, is the K uh, canon ef mount sturdy yes it's actually very sturdy because i've been uh, using this uh, like the first few days that i got it a lot, a lot of the shots i got was on my uh, tamron 70 to 200 millimeter lens which is a big uh, and heavy lens and i had no problems and then uh, on top of that I, I did try using some of the cinema glass like the zine or the cp uh, thing uh, cp2s from zeiss 
uh, under and obviously those are big kind of awkward lenses for such a small camera but you can mount it and it's, it's actually very sturdy another question is uh, about uh, the i guess the medium the the, the the media that you can use with this um uh, have you found a way to record full 6k 3 to 1 uh, in raw uh, basically or b raw uh, at uh, 50 frames per second without dropping frames and Yes, I mean, I've, I've, you know, the, the stuff that I recorded uh, or mo majority of it for my review of the camera was recorded in that. But like I said, it's just sometimes you end up noticing some problems. Like right now I have the Samsung, uh, basically uh, SSD here, the Samsung T5, and I'm set to, uh, let me just double check. Yeah, 6K, 3 to 1 compression ratio, and I'm at 50 frames per second and I hit record and it is recording. Now, question is for how long is it gonna record? My experience is that if once the card is basically above 50% of the card or the hard drive is above 50% full, that's when you might no start noticing problems. And, and what I mean by that is that it will still allow you to record, but it will sometimes after like a minute or sometimes after 30 seconds, sometimes after five minutes, it almost seems like it just goes all over the place. It will just record, record, and then we'll stop recording when it senses the, the dropped frame. But as you can see right now, I'm still recording. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's, as you can see, you can definitely record. So this is the Samsung T5, and then I also have uh, these uh, CFAS cards that also allow you to do that. So again, like I said, it's just a question of how full is your, your card or your drive. So if, I guess if you really want to record a lot of this stuff in that resolution, in that frame rate, then I would say just get... Um, the Samsung T5 but get the, the one terabyte drive this way you'll know you'll have more space and then you can fill up like, like I said safely up to half a terabyte it seems like uh, or 50 percent see now it finally stopped so it stopped at uh, was it two minutes and 16 seconds so uh, yeah two minutes and 16 seconds and that's when it stopped recording so again that gives you an idea of uh, of what kind of problems you'll have so if you want to do long long takes at that you know slow frame rate then obviously you're gonna have some problems but uh, normally when I'm shooting slow motion I don't record these extra crazy long takes because uh, another thing obviously is uh, you know and also on those high comp comp compression ratios because then you're really gonna just go through your hard drives like for example right now I'm in 3 to 1 recording 50 frames per second in 6k that uh, full 500 terabyte uh, 500 gigabyte uh, I wish it was a terabyte but it's a 500 gigabyte Samsung T5 gives me 15 minutes of space uh, so that just shows you how how much data that is uh, so definitely I whenever I record slow motion I, I just switch to the the lower compression ratios uh, and then this way I don't have any problems so if you for example drop to 5 to 1 suddenly you have uh, 30 minutes almost 30 minutes to record on a, a, you know in slow motion 50 frames per second on a five, uh, 500 gigabyte drive all right, the next question is about slow motion. So I want to see side-by-side uh, -side footage of the 120 frames per second slow motion in bo both the 4K and the 6K camera. So uh, here it is. Uh, both cameras, as you can see, obviously they're going to have different crop factors because they are recording in uh, you know different sensors, different size sensors uh, and different lenses. But uh, the 4K, you're cropping in uh, from a 4K sensor into 1080p. Whereas on the 6K, you're going from a 6K sensor to 2.8K. So your resolution is much higher. All right, next question is uh, about the rig. So can I use the same rig from the Packet 4K on the Packet 6K camera or is there a difference in size? So I'm using the same rig right now, uh, actually on this, uh, from that I had on my 4K on my 6K camera. And as you can see, it's, uh, it definitely does fit. Uh, the only thing you gotta be aware of, I would say is that certain rigs like i know i think it's a tilta that basically they put this weird thing i don't know why they did that that sticks out in the front and goes up and then that rig doesn't fit because the only difference between these two cameras when it comes to build quality is the mount or the front of here of the, where the camera is just sticks out a little bit more and it's thicker so if you have anything whether it's on the top or on the bottom that goes basically extends and goes down or you know from the top or f up from the bottom there then it's going to go into the mount but if it's for example you see even this uh, small rig cage that i have just goes forward like it has these little elements for mounting extra things that go forward 
that's fine because this mount never goes past the the original 4k body so uh, what i mean by that is it's, it's not thicker than the body itself um, so yes you definitely can uh, use the same rigs it just depends which rigs those are uh, for example if you watch my updated rig that, that i've been using with my pocket 4k it's actually the identical things now that I'm using for the Pocket 6K. So I got actually the same cage. I just got to wait for it to be delivered. It's been kind of some, some delays there, but I end up just getting another of these cages, the same mount for the SSD, everything, uh, so I can use it on both of these cameras. So it works perfectly, and that's one of the reasons why I really love using the uh, smaller rig uh, cage and all those accessories and the side handle here, which right now I mounted it on the top, but the side handle also holds the SSD in there and there's a whole bunch of cool things that you can do with this rig. So if you guys are interested, then you can check out my rig in uh, my full review of that rig for the 4K because it's identical for, you know, for the 6K. Uh, and you can see that by, uh, again, following the link in the description of the video or go to my website. All right, next question is, uh, I want to see night footage on this camera. What I guess what, I, what you're saying is, oh, you want to see uh, low light footage, right? So I did do already a comparison in low light just using a candle uh, with both of these cameras side by side so you can see that uh, and as always like, again you guys can download all of this raw footage by going to my website uh, so again i'll provide the link for that in the description uh, at the end of the day if you're wondering basically how the 6k performs in low light it is pretty much identical to the 4k and i think the 4k is great and, so, and i think the same thing about uh, the 6k because again these are cameras that have uh, dual native ISOs at 400 ISO and at 3200 ISO and that's the great thing about them is that you can switch to either so if you're shooting in low light switch to 3200 ISO and you can shoot you know and get much better quality image because it's, again you're shooting from a native ISO so there's not as much noise uh, as if, if you for example you're shooting with a camera that has native 800 ISO and then you bump up all the way to 3200 um, so that's the good thing about it and safely I would say you can go up to like 8000 ISO on both of these cameras and it's going to look beautiful and clean. Obviously you need to have some kind of light in your shot. If your shot is just pure, you know, if you're doing, I don't know, surveillance work or something, uh, hidden camera, then, then these are probably not the cameras. I mean, these are cinema cameras. So, uh, you know, even, even a DSLR or DSLM type of camera is not going to be good for that. But for anything where you actually have some light, these cameras are amazing. Like I said, even when it's very dim. All right, next question. Uh, does the 6K fit on the Ronin S, uh, Ronin SC, Moza Air 2 or Crane 3 Lab? Uh, yes, it fits in all those gimbals. Now, another question you should probably ask yourself is what's your rig? Because uh, you see, right now I have the 6K with this, you know, very small and very light uh, 50 millimeter lens from Canon. And with this, it's a nice light, small setup. Uh, if you're going to throw under a crazy long telephoto lens, then obviously some of the gimb those gimbals are going to really struggle. Uh, I would say the Ronin and the uh, Mosaire 2, uh, and even the Crane 3 Lab, they're going to handle most of what you throw on, the, on it. The Ronin SC will not. It will still fit this, uh, this camera. This camera itself is very light, but again, you got to put a very small lens on there. Uh, just maybe the one internal battery and, and yeah, a C CFAST card. You don't want to have a uh, you know, SSD attached to it externally. So uh, that's kind of, I would say, what more what you, what you should kind of ask yourself is look at the overall weight of your whole rig and then look at the specifications of your gimbal, whether it can handle that weight. Because when it comes to the, the size of it, yes, it will fit actually on all of those gimbals. Um, so that, that's the great thing about it. Now with some of those gimbals, you do have to keep in mind that um, basically I noticed that some of the gimbals, you, because the camera is so wide, because it's kind of like a DSLR, but, but even a little bit wider than that because of this big screen. Uh, so because of that, some of the gimbals, you have to kind of have to offset the center of the camera a little bit to the left, because otherwise it's going to be getting in the way of the motor. Uh, and so I found that with the um, Mozart 2 and the, the DJI Ronin S gimbals, you have to, I mean, you don't have to, because if you have a big lens, then you can put it, the camera back just enough so it clears the motor. But if you're using a lighter lens, then you're going to have to push the camera forward. Then it's going to get in the way of the motor, means that then you have to offset it to the right. It's a little like complicated. But anyways, once you have the gimbal and the camera, you'll try it out yourself and you'll see that in some cases you will want to offset it to the, to the left. And you can do that easily now because you can buy these very simple offset plates. Uh, there's various companies that make them. 
Uh, I know Moza actually makes, I think, their own. Uh, I'm not sure about DJI. Uh, but yeah, you can get these offset plates to make sure that you can, um, you know, offset the camera. And actually, I think, if I'm not mistaken, I think the small rig, which builds this cage, now also has an offset, uh, offset plate. Now, another way you can kind of get around that is by putting a cage around this camera, because if you have a cage, then you can actually offset it on any gimbal, because like, at least with this cage that I have with, uh, from Small Rig, this cage has multiple attachments on the bottom. So I can mount it here where the center of the lens, or I can attach the, the, my base plate basically to the right or to the left. So that is actually one big advantage again of using this cage. All right, let's jump to the next question. Is there more jello when shooting in 6K? Nope, it's the same. Doesn't matter which resolution or thing you're shooting because even the ones that are shooting in 6K but downscaling it, they still have to do a full readout of the sensor. And the ones that are shooting basically cropped in, I mean, they don't do the full readout of the sensor, but the section that they read out reads, reads out at the same uh, basically speed. So there is no difference. So when you look at my, uh, again, my cinema camera tests, you can see there uh, how, when I'm painting basically left and right, how the jello looks or the rolling shutter effect. Uh, and it's the same pretty much as the 4K and also very similar to even like the Ursa Mini Pro or, or uh, Alexa. All right, another question is, uh, can you use this camera for live streaming for many, many hours? Uh, yes, you can use it for many, many, many hours because uh, obviously it's a, it's a cinema camera, but it also has all these other cool functions that you, uh, you can use it for. For example, I used it actually for uh, streaming live uh, of, on YouTube. And the, the reason is because you can just connect your power cable that comes with the camera plug it in here then this way you don't have to worry about uh, battery life and then on top of that you can connect you can put in an SD card you can put in a CFAS card and you can put in a, a hard drive here so you can have multiple media and you can record to that uh, you know for basically a very 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 long time so yes you definitely is a camera I would say that's good for live events in, in that sense Another question is, uh, it's about the adapters for the 6K. So can you, any other lens be adapted to the EF mount? As far as I know, or at least uh, as far as I've tried, uh, because I think Pentax you can, but anyways, I've tried the Nikon, uh, the, or all, you know, like the old Nikon or the new, newer ones, Nikers. Uh, you can mount it onto the Canon EF. There's very simple adapters you can find. They're very thin that still allow you to do that. Uh, when it comes to uh, lenses from uh, mirrorless cameras, whether it's Sony or Lumix or whatever, those you will not be able to adapt because of the flange distance. The mirrorless cameras obviously have a much more shorter flange distance. Canon EF has much longer flange distance and so basically you just, you can't fit it in there physically. All right, next question, is there stabilization? Uh, there is no in-body stabilization or basically like a stabilized sensor. Uh, because again, it's a cinema camera. So like the red cameras or Arri Alexas, whatever, none of them have a stabilized sensor because as a cinematographer, just trust me, on a, on a, when you're working on films, uh, last thing you want is to have a stabilized sensor. It creates a lot of weird artifacts. But for, for average video, you know, basically camera, it's a great feature, right? Especially if you're doing vlogging or things like that. Now you can have, uh, obviously, uh, you can have optical stabilization. What I mean by that is, if you buy a lens that is optically stabilized, then, uh, you know, Canon EF lens, then this camera will provide power to it. Now, one thing to be aware of is when you're running off of batteries, and I kind of talked about that in my review, is when you're running this camera off of the, the batteries here, then the image stabilization on your lenses will not be activated until you press record, and then it is fully activated. Uh, I'm guessing it has something to do with, with uh, trying to save the power since the batteries, you know, kind of uh, don't last very long on, on, these, on these cameras. Uh, now, the second you connect it through the AC plug, um, then no problem, the image stabilization works whether you're recording or not. All right, next question is, what is the highest usable ISO while still retaining 13 steps of dynamic range? Uh, it's going to be the 3200 ISO, and that's because that's the other native uh, ISO. So, Basically, whenever you want to get the highest uh, dynamic range out of any camera, you always want to be recording in the native ISO. Because anything else, I, I, you know, if you go a step up or down from the native ISO, really all you're doing is kind of the same thing as if you were to record your footage in a certain, you know, basically setting and certain brightness, and then in, in your computer, you adjust the exposure and then brighten or, dar or darken their image there. Uh, so you're always going to be losing either the, the shadows or the highlights. So in this camera, actually, that's the amazing thing is you can get 13 steps of dynamic range 
both in 3200 ISO or in 400. Obviously the 400 is going to be more better in capturing more you know, stops of light in uh, the higher or the, the basically above the midpoint. And in 3200 you're capturing more in the darks, so in the shadow areas or below the midpoint. All right, next question. Are there any uh, overheating problems? Nope, both of these cameras are, that's the one thing that I really love about them is that they're built like a proper cinema camera and they both have nice big vents and uh, uh, the 6K version actually has even bigger vents here on the top and the bottom. And that's, I guess, because the, again, the, the mount is bigger, so it allows you to have that. But anyways, both of them have great venting and never had any problems. I've been shooting, even today, it's, 85 degrees outside and uh, you know it's it's uh, it's it's a nice and warm day but anyways even with this weather I have I've had the cameras on for over an hour now while I was kind of getting ready no problems the cameras never shut down on you because of overheating all right another question is the 4k footage from the pocket 6k sharper than the pocket 4k um, I guess I'll you know I, I don't want to be the one to judge because if I'll say something somebody says no you're wrong whatever it's a very subjective thing so I'll let you guys just watch the examples so here's the 4k footage from the pocket uh, 4k and now here is the 4k footage from the 6k camera which is obviously downrest so that's how it looks all right let's jump to the next question what are the extra accessories you recommend for the pocket 6k um, like I mentioned definitely a cage it just allows you to mount a lot of things uh, and I mean pretty much the exact same accessories that I <laughs> recommend for the 4k so again watch my video about that rig uh, and then you can kind of see as you'll notice I'm putting the exact same things on the 6k so uh, but definitely a cage I think the Samsung SSD is a great way to record basically have a lot of recording media the side handle which right now I mounted on top but you can put it here on the side which also protects your SSD drive because you put it there inside uh, so that's another thing. Another cool thing is this uh, microphone the, uh, from Asden, which has the mini uh, XLR connection directly, and it's a very good microphone. So you can put that on there and get really good directional audio. So that's another little uh, cool accessory. And I would say pretty much everything that I've had on my Pocket 4K, except obviously without buying the Metabones, because this camera, you know, that Metabone basically won't work on it. All right, next question. Uh, is it worth upgrading from the packet 4k to the 6k uh, I, I wouldn't even I would say don't think in those terms simply because uh, they're just different cameras in the sense that they both have the great you know overall design nice screens beautiful recording medium but obviously the 4k is meant to be used mainly with uh, micro four thirds lenses and this one is uh, is meant to be used with Canon EF glass and it's also a super 35 millimeter image sensor so those are the main big things. The resolution itself, for most people, won't matter. And for me, most of the time, it doesn't matter. The fact that this one shoots 6K. When I'm doing visual effects work, yes, then the extra resolution is always helpful. It makes it easier for tracking or stabilizing footage or for, uh, you know, compositing anything in there and, and things like that. You always have more details or reframing your shots. Uh, but otherwise, I don't care about the, the extra resolution. What I care about is that this camera allows me to use uh, the Canon EF lenses. So I would say this, if you want a camera with a bigger image sensor, which allows you to more easily get shallower depth of field and things like that, but also so that you can use uh, Canon EF glass, let maybe you have a big collection of those lenses from your old days of shooting, I don't know, on the Canon 5D. Well, then in that case, I would say just get the Pocket 6K. Uh, if you have a lot of micro four thirds lenses because you're um, a Canon, you know, a Panasonic GH5 uh, or GH4 even user, then you probably want, you want to go with the 4K because again, they're both great cameras. So don't think of it as an upgrade. If you already have the packet 4K and you're happy with it and you have the full rig, you're not going to see that much of a difference with this one again, because the resolution is not going to make that much of a big difference unless you're doing uh, visual effects or a lot of reframing. Uh, but otherwise, yeah, I, I wouldn't even say you should think of it as upgrading. It's sort of more like if you love the 4K and you want to have another camera like that, but that gives you the ability to use Canon EF lenses, then get the 6K. Otherwise, it's not really worth it. All uh, right, now, next question. Do you think major TV networks and on-demand studios such as Netflix will accept shows filmed on the Blackmagic Packet Cinema 6K? Uh, I mean, both of these cameras actually meet the specs that are listed by Netflix. Now Netflix on their website still hasn't updated because simply because there's so many new cameras coming out. So they haven't updated their list of approved cameras, 
but they have like a general like a sort of you know set of requirements camera has to be able to record natively in 4k or higher resolution has to be able to record in raw like things like that that they have and yes both of these cameras meet those specifications so they and, and if you're just wondering whether the quality of this camera like the, the actual codec image quality whether it's good enough to be shown on television or in a you know major motion picture yes definitely these cameras meet all the specifications it really just comes down to you know do you prefer the look of this camera versus the red camera or something like that or or some of the other options maybe you know you don't like the, the smaller form factor of this camera things like that but otherwise when it, when it comes to just purely the quality it is definitely there like i said after all it is like a, it's like a little miniature cinema camera that records in raw next question reliability wise would you bring it on a professional camera shoot if so what codec and settings would you use uh, i i have used the 4k already on a professional shoot 6k not yet just kind of my own test so far uh, and i i shoot always in the black magic raw or b-raw uh, setting because it's raw it gives me the the, you know, the capability to change settings afterwards and also because if you adjust the the recording ratio and i'll tell you i record like 80 percent of the time and five to one recording ratio uh you can go to three to one but i almost don't see like when i was doing tests personally i don't see the difference in three to one to five to one maybe in certain scenarios if there's like some crazy amount of detail in your shot may maybe then and if you're like punching in on your shot but otherwise i would say five to one is the way to go or if you're doing and that's like for like the top of the line big projects that i'm shooting even like a film films when i was working on uh, with the 4k that's what that's what i used but otherwise i use even like 8 to 1 or 12 to 1 again it still looks beautiful and the good thing about shooting b-raw on these cameras is that whether you're, sh you're shooting like i said in 5 to 1 or 8 to 1 uh, the quality is doesn't really seem to be diminished but the file sizes and the data rate are substantially smaller and and it's actually can be you can actually get this to be smaller than apple prores which is amazing so uh, again you're gonna have more more recording media you know and more things that you can fit more footage you can fit on there uh, without having to wor also worry really about sacrificing the quality all right next question how much time do you get on the ssd in some of the shooting formats well let's see right now then so uh, let me actually jump right now just format this uh, ssd actually this this card here uh, oh no this is the t5 here so i'll format that i haven't really recorded anything here all right it's formatting and i'm gonna just kind of go through the different settings and we'll see how how long it shows us that I can record for and this is always dead on accurate so right now I'm in a 6k 3 to 1 so highest setting and this is in uh, 24 frames per second and on the 500 gigabyte basically uh, SSD that I have up here so just keep that in mind for all of this is going to be for 500 uh, uh, gigabytes so on 500 gigabytes you're going to get 32 minutes in 6k at the, uh, the 3 to 1 compression ratio uh, if you go to constant quality to Q0, uh, it's also three, 32 minutes. Now, if you jump to 5 to 1 in, six to, uh, in 6K, but 5 to 1 compression ratio, suddenly you can get 53 minutes. Again, you're shooting in RAW, 6K. If you go to 8 to 1, which again looks amazing, like you can shoot professional projects in 8 to 1, you're getting 85 minutes recording in 6K RAW. <laughs> So pretty crazy and then in 12 to 1 is uh, 128 minutes now what if i jump to let's say if i'm recording in 2.8k or let's say 4k because a lot of times people are recording in 4k so 4k in prores then hq i can record in 80 uh, up to 87 minutes so 87 minutes if i jump to prores lt that's 187 minutes so very very high uh, and now if i jump to hd and hd in prores lt is 792 minutes so crazy amount of uh, uh, space now if i go to prores hq it's 373 minutes so still a lot of stuff you can record so now in black magic raw but in 2.8k and this is going to be in three to one you can record 155 minutes 5 to 1 you can record 257 minutes 
8 to 1 compression is uh, 410 minutes and 12 to 1 it will give you 611 minutes so definitely a lot of uh, recording space with just that one ssd all right next question uh, can you go wider with the packet 6k or packet 4k uh, with the speed booster i'm guessing you mean the field of view and uh no that's when you actually put the speed booster on this if you saw my a review of the packet 6k where i kind of compare there's a section where i compare the uh, compare it to the 4k with the the speed booster on this camera the, the 4k is actually wider or you could say kind of you know makes it look like you have a bigger image sensor uh, than than this it's slightly wider obviously without the speed booster this one's going to be wider all right next question uh, can you record 6k q0 3 to 1 compression on the t5 without dropping frames uh, i kind of already talked about this but now let's try it in just 24 frames per second so uh, uh, i'll go here q0 6k and we are in 24 frames per second and let's hit record and it is recording and i don't know I, I think the data rate is actually smaller significantly smaller when you're recording 24 frames per second so it shouldn't have any problems but anyways i'll leave this running and we'll see we'll see if it stops all right next question which one makes better coffee 4k or 6k <laughs> i don't drink coffee so i wouldn't know <laughs> all right next question do you think there will be a, a b raw plugin for final cut pro x and how is the current workflow with b raw so uh, B-RAW or Blackmagic RAW it works natively, obviously, in the uh, DaVinci Resolve, which, by the way, and for those of you who are not aware, whether you buy the Packet 4K or Packet 6K, each time you buy this camera, you get uh, a full license to the DaVinci Resolve uh, Studio, the full, full software with unlimited updates, lifetime updates. So uh, that's like a $300 value right there. And if you watch my video where I, last year I switched from using uh, adobe premiere to final cut pro then uh, if you haven't seen it watch it because i might just give, convince you to switch to davinci resolve and this way if you buy this camera you get the, the software uh, included and it's an amazing software for editing now but doing visual effects even really good for sound but amazing for color grading i actually use been using it for color grading for uh, over 10 years but uh, only last year I switched to doing all of my editing exclusively in DaVinci Resolve. So in DaVinci Resolve, Blackmagic RAW works no problem, even from the 6K, because now with the latest update, it just works. Now, um, in, on the Adobe Premiere, you can edit Blackmagic RAW right there, and you can change all your settings, the, the, uh, the RAW settings. Uh, you just have to get the Blackmagic RAW Studio, I believe it's called. It's a plugin. When you buy that and now they also released an update so you can load in the 6k footage from the packet 6k and it just you install the plugin and it you import your the BRAW files into premiere and it works no problem in final cut pro right now as far as i know there is no way of of actually loading in the footage now obviously if you really are keen on editing in final cut pro you can take the any of these cameras uh, that should in, in, in blackmagic raw and again, because they come with the full version of uh, DaVinci Resolve, it, DaVinci Resolve lets you uh, take all the footage, let's say, at the end of your day and do batch processing. And it work, does it very well. And you can compress it to whether it's Apple ProRes or DNX HD or any other really format. So you can compress it to any other format and then you can import, obviously, Apple ProRes into Final Cut Pro. All right, next question. Uh, do you think uh, anyone will develop a speed booster for the 6K? Uh, there definitely will not be a speed booster like the, the type that you know, kind of like this adapter that you can t easily take out take it uh, put it on and put it take it off uh, like there are you know the ones that are available for the packet 4k simply because again the mount is uh, much longer so the fl flange distance doesn't allow you to do that but there is a company up there uh, Lucas I think something it's from France uh, I think, or Italy, and um, somewhere from Europe. They, anyways, they created this sort of a, like a speed booster for the Ursa Mini Pro before, and now they're working on one for the Packet 6K. I believe they they have a Kickstarter app, so you can you know go and and spend your money there and, and hope that you get it soon. Uh, but basically, it's like a speed booster, but it's one that you kind of mount it, and I guess technically it's not permanent. You can remove it, but you mount it actually inside the camera. 
personally, I would kind of say, unless, first of all, unless you're really good with doing that kind of stuff and you're not afraid of, of damaging your sensor and definitely voiding your warranty, I would say, you know, don't do that. Uh, because like I said, there's always gonna be risks whenever you're mounting things inside that are very close to the sensor. So that's one thing. But also when it comes to the quality of that uh, speed booster, I don't know whether it's good or not. So I, I'm not gonna be vouching for it. If I have a chance to use that, that speed booster, then I definitely will. And so I can just kind of show it to you guys whether it's worth upgrading to it. But uh, again, right now I can't recommend it, but yes, there is uh, gonna be a speed booster, looks like at least for right now developed by one company uh, that will effectively convert the super 35 millimeter image sensor and kind of mimic it so it looks like it's a full frame camera. All right, next question is, doo -doo -doo -doo, is the 6K more reliable than the packet 4K? Um, no, I mean, they're pretty much the same camera. So 4K, by the way, is super reliable. Like I said, whether it's super hot weather, the sun, or what, doesn't matter where you're shooting uh, or, or cold weather, or when I was shooting stuff like with it on the beach and we had dust and sand flying around, I had no problems. Yeah, the camera is rock solid. It's actually very strong body too. It's like this special type of like carbon fiber kind of induced plastic. So very sturdy built and everything. And yeah, I have had no reliability issues with uh, with any of the, I would say for the last like three years with any of the Blackmagic cameras. I've been you've used the, the Ursa Mini 4K, the original one, then the Ursa Mini 4.6K, then I used the Ursa Mini Pro, then now I've been using these pocket cameras and no problems with any, with any of these cameras. And, and at the same time, I've actually heard from a friend of mine who that he damaged his own 4K simply because he connected a wrong cable there for the power so he actually burned the camera and he sent it to Blackmagic and because it was still under warranty Blackmagic still fixed the whole camera not only that but they did it when under a week he basically got it back in like I think he said it was six business days so he said it was really quick he kind of sent it over the weekend it got there and by the following weekend he got, he got it back so really, really amazing service that Blackmagic has now and the fact that they serviced this camera even though it was his fault Again, it was, it was really amazing. All right, next question. Is the Ursa Mini Pro better than the Pocket 6K? Uh, and yeah, that's the last question actually. And uh, better, I guess it depends on how you're looking at it. If you're just gonna look at image quality, I mean, if you think the higher resolution is better, then obviously this one has higher re resolution. The other one, the Ursa Mini Pro is 4.6K. Uh, so this one is better in terms of resolution, Pocket, I mean, Ursa Mini Pro is better because it has a higher dynamic range. The colors are very similar and they're just as easy to grade on both cameras. And if, again, look at my cinema camera tests that I did where I compared this to the Ursa Mini Pro and even the Arri Alexa Mini and, and the RED camera. And you can see there that it performs amazingly well amongst all these cameras. So I think it's kind of hard to say, but if you were to ask me personally, I guess, I would still say that simply because the dyna dynamic range is slightly better, more pleasing on the, the Ursa Mini Pro, but it's a very small and significant difference. So like you now this, this thing also, this, if you just shot to something with this camera, it would look amazing. It's just Ursa Mini Pro will give you that a little bit of extra, technically they're saying two extra stops of light. Uh, now, when it comes to the size and the weight, I would say this one's better because the Ursa Mini Pro, uh, first of all, requires much bigger batteries, draws more power than th this, this camera. And it's just a bigger, heavier camera. This one is so small. If you pair it with a small lens, it, then that's a very big advantage. So it depends on what terms, you, I guess you're wondering uh, if this one is better. But I, I would say they're both the Ursa Mini Pro and th this camera or the Packet 4K, they're all great cameras. It just they all have their advantages and maybe disadvantages in certain aspects. Anyways, uh, that's it for the, uh, these questions, I guess. Uh, and also, yeah, just to answer your question about shooting in 6K uh, Q0. Yes, you can see it's still recording. It's been, what, nine minutes almost. So I've uh, been recording without any problems to the Samsung SSD. Uh, so yeah, you can definitely do that. So I'll, I'll start recording here. Um, and uh, yeah, if you guys, I guess if you have any other questions that I still have not answered, then let me know again in the comment section below. Or even better, go to my website over there. I kind of simply because YouTube filters a lot of comments. Some of them they don't even post publicly. I don't even know. Like sometimes the YouTube algorithm is just 
it, it's just beyond me. I have no idea what the hell it's doing, but it looks at, like a totally normal comment that somebody left and it just deletes it or filters it out. So I can't see it unless I go through all these filter comments. And if you know, you know anything about YouTube and if you know, if you've been following me, I've got a lot of videos, a lot of views I'm getting, but a lot of videos and a lot of questions on a lot of these videos. So I can't possibly go through all of my past videos. So that's why I always say, best way to get in touch with me or ask me a question is through my website. You can either leave your question on the latest post on my website or go to the contact page on my website and just send me an email. And uh, that's it. Otherwise, again, if you guys want to download all the raw test footage from this camera or the Pocket 4K, uh, if you guys want to, like I said, yeah, download any of my other free downloads, whether it's some of the LUTs that I developed for the Pocket 4K and 6K and or there are so many cameras, again, Get all of that on my website, which is TomAntosFilms.com. And I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye.